There's a war going on. The battleground is the highway, the local streets. The two-minute drive to the grocery at a leisurely 20 miles an hour. The casualties are in the thousands. The cost is in the billions. And the enemy? The enemy is us. Away from the car, he wasn't... You're a terrible nuisance. It's, it's, it's awkward, it's uncomfortable to lock in a seatbelt every time you move in, in and out of an automobile. I know people who have been in accidents, and if they were wearing their seatbelt, they would have been in a lot of trouble because they wouldn't have been able to get out. On, on a short trip like that, I think I'm safe without seatbelts. Because they annoy me. They, the strap cuts in them, bothers me when I move around. I can't get into my pockets to pay tolls. Just laziness. Seatbelts. Nuisance or necessity? Most people say they're necessary for the other guy, but not for them. People just don't think that anything's going to happen to them. They say, well, the, you know, the other guy's a bad driver, but we don't control accidents. If you don't wear a seatbelt, it doesn't matter whether you're a good driver, a bad driver, you're still going to go flying through that windshield. The emergency crews that pick us up, the doctors who patch us up, know that seatbelts save lives, but only about 15% of us listen and buckle up. I myself spent many years driving around and not wearing a seatbelt. But uh, I think it only takes a few visits to this place to change your attitude and your views and, and become a highly motivated individual for seatbelts. We can tell who comes in with a seatbelt and who doesn't. The person who comes in without a seatbelt has got a, la a laceration of the head. They may have a broken bone. They may have blood on the brain. They may have a, an injury to the uh, bones about the head and neck. Uh, we just don't see that in people who wear seatbelts. 85% of us don't wear seatbelts regularly. So thousands of us suffer the consequences. In a splinter of time, the good times are gone. As much as possible, self-sufficient. You, Derek, were a football star in the Air Force Academy. You were heading toward a brilliant military career. I don't, I don't see it, see it ever in my life to achieve all those fast, wonderful things ever again, but they were good while they lasted. Some victims don't even remember the crash. Others remember the loneliness of waiting for rescue, the hospital procedures day by day, and the long voyage home. They put a vest on you, and they put, uh, with two bars going up, and they wrap a, a metal rim around your head. And they put screws into your head so your head can't move, so it's sort of held in, in a stable position. Painful? Yes. Tragic? Yes. But the private hell, the private pain, has become a staggering public burden. 137 deaths each day, 44,000 each year, and 2 million suffer serious injuries. And their lives may never be the same. Most of the victims weren't wearing seat belts. A pound of fabric and metal could have doubled their chances for living, could have spared their face and teeth and spinal cord and brain and way of life. Only 15% of us wear our seatbelts regularly. Why? Many people fear that the seatbelt traps them, so they refuse to wear them. The vice president responsible for DuPont's extensive employee safety program doesn't buy that argument. If I'm in an accident, I want to be maintain consciousness. And that belt enables me to maintain consciousness. I'm not going to be trapped in a car. I want to be able, if I'm there, I want to be able to get, unbuckle that belt and get out. If I don't have a belt on, I'm unconscious. I can't move. Some of us say that the belt is loose. How can it protect us? They catch. Um, they, they feel loose. It depends on the type of seatbelt system, restraint system you have, but they catch. They're designed to catch. There are endless excuses, and they are deadly. Why won't we wear seatbelts? The best guess is a mixture of fatalism and optimism, and a very American insistence that wearing or not wearing seatbelts is a private decision. But when that private decision becomes a public burden, do we have a right to pass mandatory seatbelt laws? Can you be forced by law to protect yourself? The freedom of not wearing seatbelts costs a fortune. Part of the price is horrible pain. The other part is economic burden. Society pays the bill. We pay, you pay. You demand that a uh, 
fire rescue or that a paramedic system or that the ambulances be available to come and get you. They're taken away from someone else. You're rushed to the hospital where we invest time and energy of nurses, doctors, uh, the rest of our team. Uh, we may treat you in the hospital with x-rays, electrocardiograms, blood. You fill up an intensive care bed. You're in a rehabilitation unit. We're caring for you for uh, thousands upon thousands of dollars. Fifty-seven billion dollars a year. Fatalities, injuries, property damage, $7 billion in insurance costs. The victims don't carry that. We do. Emergency services, legal costs, Medicare, Medicaid, aid to children. The financial crunch is endless. The crash is only the beginning. What happens is, is you go forward, and that forward force brings your face and head right through the windshield, through you know, smashing into the steering wheel, through the windshield, lifting your body right through it. The brain is twisted inside the head, Fibers within the substance of the brain are torn. The brain is struck against the inside of the skull, which ordinarily is there to protect it, but which now injures it. All of the fibers that reach the, our arms, our legs, the rest of our body are channeled into a spinal cord that isn't any larger than my index finger, and it runs down this column. There aren't any spare parts. Parts of the skin are missing. Uh... Uh, the bones of the face are broken in uh, multiple points. Um, and uh, we, we can never, in this situation, restore the face to the appearance it was before the accident. With this private pain, it seems cruel to examine the public burden. But we have to. The average injury, $7,000, which an individual might be able to handle. But brain damage and spinal cord injuries can run into hundreds of thousands of dollars. Institutional care can add more hundreds of thousands of dollars. How many of us can handle those bills? The results of a bad car accident with a spinal cord injury, with rehabilitation, with uh, basic care, multiple operations, multiple interventions with orthopedists, neurosurgeons, physical therapists, rehabilitation and care can be half a million dollars and more. After a certain amount, the insurance runs out and then the federal government has to take over. And where does the federal government get the money? They get it from your taxes. It's a long, hard, expensive road back from the moment of impact to some kind of life. The first stage is kind of shock and disbelief. It's not happening, or it's not for real, okay? Or if it's happening, it's not really happening to me. And what I'm worried about at the time is how I'd be able to keep my appointment for next Tuesday. For them to imagine being able to transfer themselves from a bed to a wheelchair seems light years away. Something like dressing themselves, brushing their teeth, these kinds of tasks can be very difficult. I was involved in the drama club and extracurricular activities. And mm -hmm. I was doing everything. Yes. The awareness of going home leads to one's realizing this is the way it may be. I'm not just in a hospital here where I'm going to get all better and when I go home everything's going to be fine. I'm going to be home with this. Tenaciousness. Tenaciousness. Yes. I think yes. that's, it brought me this far. And beyond the human cost, there's an economic impact that affects us all. How can you possibly calculate the cost of that salesman who isn't out taking care of his customers, who isn't out selling his product. There is no way. It, it, it is the numbers keep growing and growing. Your insurance costs may well go up to over a million dollars. I don't know if you would have that kind of policy or not, but someone's going to be paying for that. Let no one tell you that they are not a burden on society. Untold millions of dollars have to be spent in order to maintain this. And when that person is not capable of fulfilling his own self-actualizing his own potentials as well as contributing something to that society, it's a crime. In accidents, there are no guarantees, but a seatbelt can change the odds in your favor. Unfortunately, there are thousands of case studies like this. Both vehicles were compacts. They were both moving at 45 miles an hour. The driver with the seatbelt on unbuckled and walked away. No time off, no medical costs. The driver without the seat belt was thrown out of the car. She suffered a ruptured spleen, fractured pelvis, and head injuries. Time off work, two years so far. Medical costs, $27,700, and still rising. Add rehabilitation, continued salary, 
Indirect employer costs total to date over $86,000 and still rising. And she'll never work at her job again. But we know that seat belts are effective because we can compare in societies that have mandated the use of seat, base, seat belts by legislation. More than 30 countries have mandatory seat belt laws, and they work. Great Britain, usage went from 40% to 90%. Trauma cases dropped by one third. The savings will be about $300 million a year. Canada, the laws enacted, usage goes up sharply. Hospital admissions in Ontario dropped 40%. Australia, Facial injuries were immediately reduced by 50%. New York passes the first seatbelt law in this country. On the first day, a driver slammed into a light pole, smashed through a fence. An incredible sight, just watching my life pass in front of me. And uh, luckily, luckily I'm here because I had my seatbelt on. It was January 1st, the first day of the new seatbelt law. And for some reason or other, I had my seatbelt on. I felt it was the time, it was time. I think that uh, New York State's recent uh, institution of compulsory seatbelt wearing is, is the most progressive uh, piece of legislation uh, produced um, in, in a long time. 68% of the people say they want a law, and they want it enforced. You hear an argument that people say, we don't have a right to make me wear a seatbelt because it only affects me. Well, if you stop and think a minute, it not only affects the individual, it affects their family, it affects their neighbors, it affects the whole country because of the tremendous cost. And who's paying that cost? I'm not going to get into the issue whether this is an infringement upon one's constitutional rights or not. I don't know that. All I know is that wearing seatbelts saves lives. Airbags will also save lives, particularly in head-on collisions. Combined with seatbelts, you'll get really superior protection. But airbags are only installed in new cars. And it will take 15 years of new car production to get them in every car on the road. We need protection now. What we'd like to see is a good seat belt law where people are buckling up every time they get in a car and with proper research, proper design, a good airbag to protect you in that real head-on frontal collision. I think it's, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to save lives. They did a commercial on it with the egg. You know, the egg was fine when it was tied down, but when they didn't have the egg tied down, it was Not only will seatbelts save lives, not only will seatbelts reduce these senseless injuries, seatbelts will save us billions and billions of dollars. But only if we use them. 85% of all Americans don't wear them regularly. But they will wear them if it's the law. Pass the law today, and we'll start easing the private pain and the public burden. Delay just one day and it'll cost us 137 more lives. Delay one more day and 13,000 more of us are injured. Each day we delay costs us hundreds of millions of dollars. The facts are horrible. The issue is simple. Do we have a right to fine people for not wearing their seatbelts? Do we have a right not to?